France as a country was going into this full tilt. And if it doesn't succeed first, if you've lost 27,000 men in one day, you bring up more artillery, big guns. You do more and more and more to try and uh, succeed next time. You keep increasing the scale. You do it over a wider stretch of land. And this is why France lost so many men. So because you know about uh, the French defeat in 1940 in World War II and some, uh, uh, some shorthand ideas about the French not fighting and all this, which is a nonsense in itself because they lost mm -hmm. 60,000 men in that. Uh, this was France uh, aggressive, and the cost of that aggressiveness was paid in woods like these. The, in 1914-15, the really heavy losses came in the woods of the Argonne, came in the open fields of Champagne to the northeast of, of Reims, and they came near Arras, up in what the, the country called the Artois, and they came down in the woods near, near Saint-Miel, the, the Bois Brûlé and so on. Each of these was the scene of losses of tens of thousands of men. So that's all unfolded. And when Americans come in here four years later, they're stepping into trenches that have been held by Frenchmen until just the day before. They're coming into this. It's 26th of September is the start date of the battle that takes place uh, in these woods. Uh, on the 12th of September, so just two weeks before, had been the Battle of San Miel. That was a, a, a good victory for the Americans. That worked really well. And they moved across here. Uh, George Marshall made his name, organizing the movements of men from San Miel to here. He did all the planning for that. He was a colonel, went on to be the chief of staff during World War II and Secretary of State in, in the 40s. Um, and so Americans have come into here with one, one good battle under their belt. And the 26th of September is the beginning of a really hard <coughs> month. That next month was your learning curve of um, the scale of World War I battles, the fact that if you just keep sending men regardless towards machine guns, they're going to get mown down in huge numbers. You've got to do things uh, differently. Choosing a Bucknellian was the hardest part about this project for me because it's hard to say that one person's service and sacrifice is more important or more interesting than another person's. And so I definitely, I struggle with that a bit and it took me a little bit long, longer than I had hoped to ch actually choose my Bucknellian. What really drew me to Charles O'Brien with this limited information that we had was that he attended law school in Wilkes Bar and that he was a recipient of the Distinguished Service Cross. And so that gave me a little bit more to work with as far as research and there had to be an element of interest to some degree um, and a little bit more information for me to be able to, um, to find within, within the tidbits of information that we were provided or that we initially found. Um, after graduating from 1909, he attended law school at Wilkes Bar and he was a class of um, 1912 there. He was stationed in um, Was and served in 77th Division in the 306th Infantry Regiment of the EEF, um, which is the same regiment and division as Roy Schaffner, as we know. Um, and he served there from September 1917 to September 5th or 6th, um, 1918. Um, he lost his life to a fatal gunshot during his um, time of service. He was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross um, for extra extraordinary um, heroism in action. Um, he led his platoon for a tour of the um, Lee Sendrier woods, or Les Sendrier woods, under heavy shell fire. 
um, when one of them led one of his men or him to stop and have the wound dressed, he answered, never mind that, they can't stop us, and led his platoon through the woods to, um, to the bank of the Anne's Canal, where, placing his men in position, he was struck again and killed. His dauntless courage presented an inspiring example to the men of his platoon. Um, the fact that Charles O'Brien was around our age and essentially just graduated college a few years prior, um, it's very, it's, it's kind of hard to cope with in a way because it's, it ma almost makes you wonder if you would do that, if you would sacrifice, you know, all of the potential that you have as an American citizen in their daily life, if you would do the same as he did. And, you know, you can only hope that your answer would be yes. And he was, we can, you know, we can create hypo hypotheticals all we want, but he was actually faced with that question and he followed through with it and he led, you know, he, he led his platoon members to accomplish great things and he hopefully inspired them in a way that carried on throughout, throughout their service as well. Bye.